Hi, I'm Annie Leonard with the story of Stuff. Welcome to another episode of The Good Stuff, where we talk with people who are working on solutions to the take-make-waste system that's trashing the planet, threatening our communities, and harming our health. Collaborative consumption is all the buzz these days. Online services with cool names like Airbnb, Uber, and FreeCycle are sprouting like wildflowers. You can use an app to rent out a spare room to a traveler who wants to avoid generic hotels, catch a ride to the airport in someone's car instead of a taxi, or give away that old crib to someone who just had a baby. Cities are putting bike share stations on the street, free for anyone to use and leave for the next person who needs it. Folks are realizing that not every household needs a pickup or power drill if one can be used by several neighbors. Wait a minute, collaborative consumption? Sounds like good old-fashioned sharing to me. That's right, sharing has become so trendy that it has a new name. But whatever you call it, the rise of the sharing economy could revolutionize our relationship with stuff and with each other. Sharing can be good for the environment, good for the economy, and good for building community. Today on The Good Stuff, we present the first of two programs on sharing. We'll talk with two leaders of the sharing movement who will discuss both the promise of collaborative consumption and the challenges of making it work for everyone. Let's go. My guest today has had a fascinating life as an activist. At age 13, he became a member of Greenpeace. While still in college, he founded the Sierra Student Coalition, the first national student-run environmental organization which helped create Death Valley National Park in the California desert. At 23, he became the youngest ever president of the Sierra Club. He then astounded a lot of his colleagues by going to work for Walmart to help the big box chain reduce its environmental footprint. Along the way, he realized that a root cause of the environmental crisis is that people are buying, using, and throwing away too much stuff. So two years ago, he founded Yertle, that's Y-E-R-D-L-E, an online platform aimed at turning shoppers into sharers. Welcome to The Good Stuff, Adam Wehrbach. Hi, Annie. It's great to be with you here today. The mission of Yertle is basically to reduce the number of things that we all need to buy by 25% by finding them in the closets and garages of our friends and neighbors. Which are awfully full of stuff, I can attest. (laughs) Well, it's amazing how much stuff we all have. And just think about what your garage looks like, what your closet looks like, what your trunk of your car looks like, that, you know, that stuff drawer you have in your kitchen, that cord drawer you have in your living room. You know, those things are relatively universal experiences because the, the, the speed at which we change and blow through technology is just outrageous. And the thing stuff is perfectly functional. And, you know, our challenge is to say, hey, look, you don't necessarily need to have the latest and greatest. You need to have the thing that serves the need. Um, but more importantly, um, you can get what you need without spending a lot of money um, while con- connecting with your friends and family and while reducing the amount of waste in your life. So that's an excellent mission, but what's Yertle going to do about it? What does Yertle actually do each day? So every day we basically send out an email of all the free things that people are giving away on Yertle and offering people to get them. Um, It's pretty simple, right? So um, about 90% of the items that people put up are taken immediately. Uh, and um, you can do it through an app, an iPhone app, if you have one of those smartphones, um, and browse thousands of items that are available. Or you can just look at an email and say, I want that. And we've set up a very simple currency system in it where basically you get credits if you give items, and you can spend those credits on anything you want, from a Patagonia jacket to a new tent to a kid's bike. And, you know, one of the reasons I love Story of Stuff is that you know the conversation is, how do we actually build these relationships in our community so we can do this? And, you know, in some ways we see ourselves as kind of a, um, I don't know, a stepladder towards it. Can we actually make sharing as simple uh, and as beautiful as modern shopping has become? One of the things we said in our last film in the Story of Solutions is that sharing is deceptively simple, (laughs) is that it sounds like the theme of a Barney song or something we learned in kindergarten. And it can be as simple as um, trading, sharing a tool or trading something with your next door neighbor. But its potential really is revolutionary. It really could transform our relationship to stuff and our relationship to each other. When you think about it, the informal economy, the type of sharing that you do with your sister or your daughter or your, uh, you know, your, your friends, your neighbors, that you do without even thinking about it, far you know, outstrips the type of formal economy we see. There's about a trillion dollars in the United States spent every year on durable goods, not cars, but durable <coughs> goods, things like kitchenware, kitchen appliances, and um, camping gear, and outdoors, uh, uh, decorative arts, those sorts of things. And when you think about it, those things can be found very simply locally 
uh, among your friends. So why would you have to go to the expense of buying those things? I mean, partly we do it for the kind of somatic response because it feels good to get something new. But is it is it that smell of fresh plastic or is it that you've just – it's a new experience you're trying to get? And humanity is – you know, it's very interested in new things. That's great. I think we should, you know, we should encourage that. Sharing shouldn't necessarily be about like cutting back. It should be about experiencing more and this opportunity because you don't have to use money to actually have all these different experiences you never had the chance to do because you didn't have the money before. You didn't have the space to, for it. So I think that sort of thrill of getting something new is beginning to be outweighed by the burden of then taking care of it mm. ongoing. I mean, as you said, all of our houses are full. How often when someone gives you a present, a gift is the first thought is, where am I going to put this? Mm. Like our houses are full. Our closets are full. Our garages are full. Our drawers are full. Well, you know, it's full. We're, we have enough. Most of us in this country have enough stuff. And so – to me, I think that's very um, hopeful because that is something that can overcome that mm. desire for, for the latest, newest thing. Um, and it seems like this is really catching on. Am I just extra looking for it or are a lot more people talking about sharing now than they were five years ago? Well, I think there's two trends that have, that have collided. One was a recession that we're still coming out of um, where people really needed to find ways to make dollars stretch. stretch. Um, so that's, that's uh, you know, a strong economic push for it. Um, the second is this 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 conversion of or this convergence between that economic need and new technology, um, and we've seen a, a group of companies that might be called part of this sort of sharing economy or sharing technology that's allowing people to use resources more effectively. But I think there's another obstacle to sharing besides not knowing that your neighbor has a power drill or a jackhammer or whatever you need. Um, I run across people often, and I think back to my own childhood with my own mother who are scared or, or worried or there's some sort of cultural inhibition to ask about sharing. And so while the technology can help facilitate sharing in some way, we also need to shift cultural norms so that sharing becomes more of a acceptable and even cool thing to do. Have you run across these ob obstacles and do you have any ideas about how we can help overcome them? Well, some of the things that, that you know, that I guess I see work are, are just starting. Like what's pretty amazing is that you give someone a challenge. I mean, I would encourage everyone who's listening to this now, try to the next thing you're thinking of buying, right, honestly think about calling three people and seeing if they have it. I mean, it's, 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 it may seem strange, but, hey, you might save 50 bucks in the process. And worst comes to worst, you talk to three good friends, right? And I will bet you that one of them has it or knows someone who has it. So I think the first step is just start by asking and, and see what, where it goes. There is a, um, a mom uh, who I met who recently had her third child um, and – you know, she's, so she's a pro <laughs> at this point. And she just said, look, I'm not having – I don't want to own one piece of plastic, of new plastic with this child. Um, so everything that she um, she had for Elle was uh, – came off of Yertle. And about well, – Elle's now one. It's all gone now. It's all back on Yertle and gone. Um, she just made sure that that stuff didn't hang around in her house because she didn't want it. So she got it for free and she gave it away and someone else has got it. So Yertle helps you get stuff out of your house that you don't need anymore. It helps make sure that stuff doesn't end up in a landfill or an incinerator. And it helps um, provide people with things that they might not otherwise be able to afford or, or want to spend money on. What are some of the less tangible benefits that you're seeing coming out of sharing? Shopping always feels a little empty to me. I, you know, um, I know you're not a huge <laughs> shop, shopper, but it's, it's, it doesn't feel um, good. You know, it might feel good for that one moment when you get the thing or that anticipation. But once you have it, it feels kind of empty. And that's very different than thinking about, you know, something that you've gotten from someone, another human who's given it to you and you get to use. I definitely agree. My favorite piece of jewelry is a ring that I have that is inscribed on the inside. It says May 16th, 1893. Wow. And I love thinking about who wore this beforehand and, you know, for what, why did she get it? Who gave it to her? Where has it been? Um, May is spelt M-A-I. So I'm so curious. Did it wow. come from France? You know, I just love thinking about the history. So I agree that getting things with a history is more meaningful. And I also think that giving something away within your community feels better. My daughter just outgrew a bunch of snowware, and I could have dropped it off at the local thrift stop. But if I instead share it through a platform like Yertle, I'm sharing it with my community. And there's something about giving this to a community that is working to build a different kind of marketplace, a different kind of relationship that just feels better than just dropping it off at the Goodwill. I, I've been talking to a number of economists 
um, around this question, like, is it economically productive to share? Um, and their perspective is absolutely. I mean, basically, if you can create the pro increase the productivity per ounce of natural resource from the earth, you're doing very, very good from an economic standpoint. So essentially, what we want to do is instead of you know, basically putting all of our economic assets into um, into taking things from the earth, manufacturing and stuff, and then storing it where it does nothing, we end up, you know, basically taking a cycle where we, where we do all that effort, we make something, and then we use it constantly. And that increases employment, it increases productivity, and in the end, it actually does increase GDP as well. And builds community. This is what I love about sharing so much and why I'm such a huge fan is because, of course, I love that increasing the per unit efficiency of each item. I mean, if, if a whole block of neighbors can have one power drill rather than each person have a power drill, that's that much less plastic that has to be formulated, that much less metal that has to be drilled. But in the other benefit is that you have to talk to each other to share. And as we move into this sort of ecologically uncertain future, the one thing that I think is going to be most powerful to help us get through is a stronger sense of community. Community, it all starts from community. I mean, it, you, if you're scared of your neighbors, you don't know your neighbors, you're not going to share with your neighbors. You know, it's it's sort of a, it, this is a, as I said, this is a, there's a communal movement that's happening and sharing is, you know, it, I do have to say it, it may be a gateway drug into some community building because, um, you know, for, for good or for ill, Americans are very attached to their stuff. Um, and, you know, what we're finding is that there, there are a number of different audiences of people who have been excited about Yertle. You know, for example, we see um, a lot of moms um, who, you know, basically are managing a loading dock in their home every day because they're just moving things in, moving things out, moving things in, moving things out. And they're, they're amazing, right? They're able to make the family budget stretch, get their kids in clothes, get their kids in all these sort of experience, you know, experience gear to actually do whatever they want um, and, you know, somehow make it all work. Um, so this is a tool for them to, to, you know, sharing is a tool for them to do that better. We've also seen a, kind of a very you know, um, uh, interesting group of millennials aged 17 to 23, 24, um, who don't want to have a lot of stuff. They, they want to have a lot of experiences. They want to eat really good food and they want to go see lots of art and make art and travel a ton, but they don't want to have a lot of things. Um, so some of the most generous people that I've seen on Yertle, people who don't have a lot of things but are giving a lot away, are these young people who just don't want to have the burden of stuff. They, they, you know, we sort of call them this asset light generation. They probably don't have a car. They might bike around. Um, you go to their, their apartments and they're pretty sparse, um, but they're living very rich lives. And they know that detaching themselves from the stuff is a great way to, to build those lives. It seems like in my parents' generation, which was the first generation where everybody could have a toaster and a blender and a bathing, new bathing suit every year and a second car and all these things, there was a real focus on acquisition. And um, pro this sort of sentiment was captured in that bumper sticker you might remember from the 80s about he who dies with the most toys wins. And it was all about getting more and more stuff. And the more and better and cooler stuff you had, the better human being you thought you were. It was a stuff – Acquisition of stuff was a way to demonstrate your social value. At some point along the way, the maintenance and insurance and storage and repair and, uh, of all of this stuff turned from stuff to clutter. And it's it's become a burden now rather than an asset at, at some level. So I see this shift happening from a focus on acquisition to a focus on access. Mm. People want access to a car, um, a house on some lake in the woods, music, without actually owning it. And I think these millennials who, who don't own their own cars and who use city bike share, who don't want to own all this stuff, they really embody this shift. And less stuff is being seen increasingly as liberation, as more freedom. There's a point in many people's life where more stuff does actually lead to a better life. And so we're, we get on that treadmill of more, 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 but we reach a point where each new thing increases less and less and less or adds less and less and less to our betterment and then it starts to actually decrease it but since we're not paying attention we just keep hitting replay over and over and over and getting more stuff so the more that we can cultivate a sense an internal sense of sufficiency or a internal metric that says you know i've got enough stuff that is excellent for the planet and so liberating in terms of how we spend our energy and time this is the magic right um, it's it's not something that's going to be solved by um, buying something new or finding a new app or you know it, it's it's something that actually is work that we have to do inside ourselves and with our friends and our family and our community. How do we sign up? 
So you just go to www.yerdle, which is Y-E-R-D-L-E dot com and sign up. And it's kind of a funny, funny name, but um, uh, it, it's pretty simple, actually. Um, you know, that, that's the idea is that the sharing shouldn't be so hard. It shouldn't be difficult. It should be easy, lovely, and most of all, it should be free. without saying that I'm a big believer in sharing, and it's a big part of my life. I'm lucky enough to live on the same street as my closest friends, and we not only share things like pickups and power drills, but we look after each other's kids, tend our common garden, and share meals with each other. Whenever we need something, we know we can first turn to our community before having to turn to the marketplace. That's easier on the planet, easier on our budgets, and it gives us an opportunity to chat with each other. Even when I'm away from home, I share. I travel a lot. Whenever I can, I stay in people's homes. I've made a lot of great friends that way. If you want to get started with sharing, why not take the challenge Adam posed to me? The next time you need something, instead of going to the store, phone three friends and see if they have it. You've got nothing to lose. You might save some money. But even if you don't, you'll get to talk to your friends. Try it and let us know what happens. In part two, We'll talk with an expert on issues that may arise if you want to think bigger about sharing, like creating a co-housing community. We'll also talk about how we can make sure that the sharing economy works fairly and returns the benefits to us, the people doing the sharing, instead of profits to corporations. That's it for this episode of The Good Stuff. Our show comes to you from the studios of Youth Radio in Oakland, California. Our engineer is James Rowland. The Good Stuff is produced by Bill Walker. We'll have another show online in a few weeks. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Find us on Facebook and storyofstuff.org and keep working on the good stuff in your own community. Thanks for being part of the solution.